Hello and good morning. My name is Richard Miller. You're at Never Not Here, and you're always totally welcome to come. And uh, who knows? I mean, I'm thinking like I should just open shop every day, you know, and go back to my webcasting and really let everyone talk. And uh, somehow I'm your surrogate talker and your surrogate question asker. And uh, I hope I do a halfway decent job. I'm trying not to leave anyone out and trying not to annoy anyone by being too stupid. And uh, so, uh, I, you know, I just don't know exactly where I'm going, but it just seems like uh, I'm looking at society, I'm looking at family life, I'm looking at uh, community, and I'm <clears throat> looking at my relationship to myself, and I'm saying, wow, there's really a big psychological component to everything we do on this planet. I mean, you think it's all just fixed and cut and dried, and that's the way it is, and it is what it is, and all those kind of trite statements, but there's so much psychological to it, uh, which means like uh, our attitude and what we believe in and uh, and what we think other people are doing and maybe doing to us or or with us or against us or you know and that hits kind of like gosh everywhere like the nation the and uh, the economy is really a psychological phenomena. And uh, so then what does that mean? It just means like we're telling a story, right? And if the story is a little bit jaded, uh, we feel terrible. And if the story is uh, more up, upscale, you know, we think, oh, well, maybe we can make it, right? <laughs> There's that component of our life that really is worldwide. And uh, I don't know, let's just talk about it and see what we can make of it. And uh, we're taking a little trip to Europe. We're in Denmark and we're talking to Cecile Rye Olson and welcome. Welcome to Never Not Here. Thanks, Richard. It's really nice to be with you. Um, I hope we can uh, have a good chat this uh, morning or evening. All right. I said good morning, but it's good evening also. So. <laughs> it is, yes. <laughs> yes. So there's so many explanations for uh, our feelings, you know, from karma to uh, closed chakras to, uh, uh, you know, uh, belief structures to, uh, I don't know, there's, and there's so many ways to, uh, to go after it and try to say, should we get psychoanalyzed or should we have an energy healing session or should we... <laughs> Just get just get a job could be cool, right? <laughs> Do something <laughs> yes, that's exactly. our passion, right? Do something that's our passion, and and believe that we're uh, we're contributing to society and to our family, and uh, and actually that there's something fixed and stable here that we can you know that we can work in this arena that uh, you know, and then sometimes that even breaks down even worse, and I guess that's when we become spiritual seekers, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> yes, when when we are in deepest trouble, that's when we begin to seek. I think I think that's true for most of us. Yes, I, initially, initially, I think what makes us move in that direction is utter despair and a feeling that something's missing and a deep longing for the pain to end. I think I think basically that's basically what got me moving in the first place. Yeah. So then, for sure, uh, this whole spiritual arena is built on a foundation of a, of a separate individual suffering. Mm, yes. The great story of me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And this experience, this, there is a deep experience of separation. And it is... Uh, it is driving us, and it's very much driving our feelings. This is what creates the feelings, is that I am I'm a separate self and something is happening to me. There's a story around the feelings. There's a lot of thoughts around the feelings. The feelings are confirming my belief system. 
my conditioning. So for a lot of us, very often it's the same feelings, it's the same shade of a particular feeling that keeps visiting because we are wired like that. What did you mean? Did you uh, say the the feelings not uh, verifying our belief system, or they are? No, no, they are very much verifying that. Oh, they are verifying our belief system. In other words, yes. we think it's doom. Yes. It's doom, and it sure does does feel like it too. <laughs> it is yes. If that's if that's your wiring, I mean, you will have people who who has a wiring for very happy feeling and content feelings, and they will have a much more content life experience and you will have others who are wired for doom and pain and suffering and loss and all of that and they will very often have life experiences that confirms that belief so then in order to have a be wired for a very happy feeling I mean would you say that maybe you have to be in a way cut off or insulated from things that are not happy no, I mean, there's no. so many things in the world and they're not all happy, right? No, I think, I think uh, happiness is not in the phenomena. Happiness is not at all in what is arising, what it is or what it isn't. It's, it's prior to that. That's where the deepest happiness is. So you, you can find in the world of phenomena, in, in the outside world, you can find conditional happiness. It's only, it's only nice, it's only good when it when it's moving up and it's really crap when it's moving down and that's just the way it is it goes up and it goes down and that's that's the world of phenomena it's constantly changing always shifting and lasting happiness is impossible to find in that but you can still be totally connected in the world and following this moving up and down and be totally happy totally content with whatever is moving. So whatever it is, we've come up fine. with that uh, before, saying something like, "You know, the key is actually happiness for no reason, right?" And yes, but you know that's very unknown in the world, really. I mean, even in our, you know, in much of our memory, we can say about ourselves, we can say, "Well, I always reserved happiness for uh, after I finished my job," you know whatever that job might be, you know, after I yes. achieved my goals. And I thought that uh, being too happy in the beginning and before I finished would kind of stop me from finishing, right? Or it would kind of <laughs> delay it, right? You know, <laughs> although, Perhaps. although I was probably just w working on those goals to be happy. And if, if I thought I could just be happy without the goals, I might have thrown them out the window. I think this, I think there's a, it is like a movement we all have to go through. We have to, we have to think that happiness is out there. So it's in achieving your goals or in, in finding the right partner, in settling down and having a family, having a nice house, whatever it is. I think every culture has sort of a, a checklist you can go through and see how happy should I be? I've checked all of these things and, and then now I'm, I should be the picture of happiness. And, and very often people find that they're not. They, they have great careers, they have lots of money, they have the partner they want, they have children who are healthy, and but they maybe have a second house, a third car, and whatever it is. And, and whatever the world of phenomena can offer is not bringing lasting happiness for most people. Because there's always a sense of lacking. It could be more, or maybe it should be less, or it should be another partner it should be a more expensive car i should have more power in my job i should I mean, it's there's always a lacking so no matter how much you have in the world of phenomena there's always this sense of lack of course you can and, go the other and, way you could go the other way and you could say okay well you know i had the wrong partner actually and i have the wrong and i have a really <laughs> pitiful job you know and it only you know, it's part time even and, uh, you know, I, my car broke, actually. <laughs> you know? And that's just, that's just the other way around. And that's basically, so that's just confirming the lack in a different way. But lack is still there. The experience of lack is still in there. And it doesn't really, it's so, it, when you look at it that way, it's so interesting to see that it doesn't matter how much you've got. 
the experience of lack or the fear of losing is still there. Or, I don't know, shouldn't we include that it doesn't matter how little you have? <laughs> or, I don't know, yeah, I don't want to just go in one direction, you know? And uh, No, that, but that was what I was saying. This. It doesn't matter how much you have or how little you have. It doesn't matter what you have. The experience of lack is still in there. Well, it could be. And because, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be. Aren't we saying it doesn't have to be? We are saying that it doesn't have to be, but we are also saying that most people are moving through this phase of finding out that basically I cannot find lasting happiness in the outside world, in the world of phenomena. It does not fulfill me. There's, there's an inbuilt sense of lacking, sense of that basically it could be lost in any moment because it is constantly changing. Let's iron out this one because I think a lot of people will be listening and they'll say, oh, okay, I'm in somewhere in that spectrum. I don't have too much and maybe I don't have too little, but, you know, let's say I do have the wrong partner. And, well, we fight a lot anyhow, you know. And uh, mm -hmm. so then I can see these guys, these two guys are talking about happiness for no reason. And maybe, I don't know, I can try it in different ways and sometimes I can just kind of ignore things. And, but it seems to get worse later and bite me in the back. And then uh, I can maybe, I don't know, I can investigate it and fi find this happiness. I want to find this happiness for no reason. But really what they're saying is I want, I'm, hopefully if you're happy for no reason, then uh, the lack will go away and actually I will get more stuff, you know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes, but happiness for no reason has no craving. So... It, if you have more, maybe that's fine. But if you're happy for no reason, it's not because you have more or less. It's not at all connected to that. It just is happy, content, filled, full of life, enough. There is no lack and there is no fear. When you detach yourself from the world of phenomena, from what you have and don't have, it's not important what you have and don't have. But being happy is vitally important. Being truly happy is vitally important. And we think it's connected to what we can put our hands on. And it's not. It has nothing to do with that. It is... It has... Happiness has no, no body, if I can express it that way. Then, if, if happiness has a body then it's conditioned it's conditional happiness oh i really love this partner and we have such a great life together and we are great parents and it can bring me joy but that's not because i'm happy i am just happy point so almost like we have to, we should do a check, you know, and put in a thermometer type, like a health check. And then we'll say, okay, I've got a lot of good things and I'm happy about them. But really, I'm happy before that, too. And you could yes. do a double check, you know, and not get lost into the phenomenal uh, successes that you seem to be running up. I, I think it's so, it, it's so ingrained in this Western culture that we are looking outside for fulfillment. And so just check and it could do, you could do your check with your job, with your car, with your partner, with your children, with your hobby, with whatever it is. Just check. Could you be, are you happy? Are you just happy? Not because, but just happy. Are you full of life? Just because basically you are full of life. And you are experiencing that and that is more than enough. It's more than enough. And whatever comes to you on the outside is just gifts, experiences, uh, insights, ways you share life with other people. It's beautiful. And sometimes there's a conflict. It's beautiful. Sometimes it's difficult. It's beautiful. Sometimes it's so easy, so smooth, so flowing, and it's beautiful. 
And sometimes you come head on with something that's really difficult. And it's beautiful. It doesn't matter what's coming and what's going. It's not important. Somehow there's a real conditioning about uh, when it's really smooth and really go flowing and really so easy. And then we're thinking, oh yeah, we did something right, right? We held the right attitudes. Ah, or we, yeah. or we, I did the positive thinking side. Yeah, or right. I no, no, no. Yes. I mean, that's infecting everybody, right? There, are, you know, no matter how much we say, no, it's we don't really care about that, and we just do. <laughs> yeah. I did a great experiment with my life, uh, you know, being a kind of a guy born in the center of, in Chicago is kind of like central and more or less central in the U.S., you know, and uh, and so we we're really isolated. When I was a kid, I didn't even know about foreign countries or really it was like didn't mean very much or foreign languages, right? Didn't even mean very, you know, I didn't know what even what a, I had no experience of it. Whereas if you're born in Switzerland or something, you already speak four languages, right? <laughs> Not only that you got them, you could go there 100 miles in any direction, go to another language. But So I lived in Italy for, uh, t you know, 10 years or more. And uh, in Italy, I was really uh, uh, a minority or a foreigner. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to say that I was like underemployed all those years too. I couldn't really hook in. Not that Italy has the greatest economy and the greatest jobs, but also there's forces there that, you know, jobs are always just temporary and you're never on the inside. And uh, so I know what it's like uh, to not have everything go smoothly. And I mean, people ask me, what did you do in Italy? I say, I look for a job. So I probably am the mo most expert at sending out resumes, you know. I probably sent then, out thousands, a, you know. <laughs> there's a not accepting of it. Basically, if you you just lean back and say, I had I had this experience in Italy. I sent out thousands of resumes, and I had very little jobs, but I did have some. Yeah, I did have some. And it's it's okay. You you did have some, and it's you're detached from from the outcome. You are just experiencing whatever it is flowing. It's, it's fine. It's just an experience. No matter how smooth and beautiful and flowing or how difficult and grinding and resisting it is, they're all just experiences. No difference. Just a mind attaching a difference to it. I want this, but I don't want that. I want the flow, but I don't want resistance. And, and they're just different experience, experiences of life and perfect, all of them. I, and happiness comes from not, not having a preference. I had a pretty, you know, positive attitude and I was more or less happy there. But I can't really say that I would be if I was Italian and the same thing was happening to me. Because being an American, I, could, I always thought, well, I could leave, right? And I never was really planning to leave and somehow... I did get extricated out of there without even trying, you know. I was almost forced out in a way. And, uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, so I had a, a happiness for no reason, in a way. And, or the reason was just because I was experimenting with my life in a, in a different country and kind of semi making it, you know. I was making it, but not really in any, you know, um, underemployed, but uh, so that was kind of like another, there was still a story running, so maybe that happiness was for a reason, because I was really a free agent there, and so then, but I was happy for no reason, and it really didn't get me any more jobs, I don't think, so we could say that that doesn't really do it. <laughs> no, I think, I think it's just a mind, when, when, we, when we say that, that well, if, if I'm detached and if I'm happy for no reason, then life will be good to me doesn't follow that's the mind's interpretation of it happiness is just happiness and there is no recipe so that life is now only giving you good things life is giving you everything it's not excluding every anything it's just mind trying to exclude the the so-called bad experiences but basically life is presenting you with all kinds of experiences 
and it's perfect. Happiness lies in accepting, yes, yes, I need, I need all of these different experiences, apparently. Otherwise, life wouldn't give them. It doesn't make any sense for life to give you anything <laughs> you shouldn't have. There's a, there's, a, there's a perfect precision in whatever it is you're getting. Yeah? I'm not so sure you can jump to that, you know, because we uh, say that a lot of times. But, you know, there's no life there doling out anything, and there's no, you know, perfection about the, the system of uh, passing stuff out. And uh, really, it's just, I don't know, it's, it's more, there's no, it's not personal in any way. I mean, uh, we say it like uh, um, you're receiving a certain kind of a life, and that must be what you need. You know, but I mean, I'm not so sure if any of that is anymore, but there's some kind of, um, uh, you know, these big words like anthropomorphize, you know, look at things as if it was a human, you know. Uh, there's no human up there, and God is not in a chair doling stuff out uh, or making it happens, judgments. It happens. No, no, I think we're, we're, the, we're the ones making judgment here. That's a very, very human trait, yeah? It's not, not, life is making no judgment. I think that that's humans doing that. And I think it depends on what perspective you have on life. Why are you here? Are you, are you here to learn something or are you here to feel good? The mind would like us just to feel good all the time. No problems, just flow and all the good things. May all the good things come to me. Can't we feel good while we're learning or, or feel good because we're learning so much? Or, I mean, does they have to be exclusive? No, no, of course not. I mean, I've had great stretches, but I've also had some really bumpy ones. And I think, <laughs> I think perhaps if I look back, I think that the bumpy ones were teaching me much more intensely than the smooth flowing with the river. But that's me. I, I can't say that's just a natural, that, that's not a natural law or anything, but it's just, that's how I function. No, I think um, it's pretty so, of a, much of a natural law. I'm not, I'm not so sure if I want to call it a natural law, but I, I don't think you learn so much from just everything. If everything says yes to you, how can you know? There's, actually, there, there, there's no boundary, right? If all of life is just a huge yes, uh, how do you know where to go? I mean, you'll start flying off of the uh, top of trees or, or uh, <laughs> well, leaping off the top yes. of mountains or something like that because everything is totally yes, right? Mm, yes. That's not, that's pretty, that can't be, right? Why not? I, I think that we've, we've created this strange dream where we have to suffer to learn stuff. And basically that's, that's how this, strange reality is manifesting so we are suffering and that pushes us to learn something and to mm, i think i think it is it definitely was pushing me to find an alternative a, another way to be in this world because there was so much so much suffering so much resistance that i that i i really had a feeling that there there had to be something else it could not be like that. There had to be something, something different. So that, that is what the suffering is doing. And it's doing it on a personal level. And it's doing it very much, at these times, I think, very much doing it on, on a global level. So it's like a, a both personal and global on the same t at the same time. Yeah, so I think the suffering is doing, uh, or, or the dysfunction, is doing a a great wake up call that wouldn't be there, you know. But before we were saying about why did we make this strange dream where we're suffering, and it seems to me I wanted to say that uh, if we if if we get yes to every move in our life, we're probably very timid and not making very big moves. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe so, or maybe we just wouldn't move at all because it's the I mean there's a laziness perhaps. <laughs> So suffering is making us move, and that's a good thing. Changes, a lot of different experiences are, are coming from that moving. 
and it, I think it's a, it's like massaging your whole system, so you become you become even more of a human being. The more different experiences you've said yes to, the more different experiences you've actually accepted and plunged into without reservation or hesitation. You're a, you're a, a larger being for that. And, and I, I, that the, the happiness that I, I experience is very much growing from that just broadening, 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 opening, opening, opening the perspective that anything is possible. And I have no idea what's coming. And I have no reservations, no hesitations. Are you in? I, I have no. I, I have no idea what's coming. Are you in the eurozone? <laughs> I am. Yes. <laughs> so I have absolutely no idea what's coming. <laughs> I think there's going to be hell coming is actually what I think. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we're going to take everyone with us. So, no, I, I don't know. I think I think it's interesting that, that, that a lot of the structures that we thought were infallible are, are falling apart, which is really interesting time. Well, we didn't so even think we they think... were infallible, you know. We just thought that we trusted the people that we hired to uh, operate them, that they would ha operate them for their own good and, and not only for our good, but for their own good. But it turns out they didn't do that, you know. No. <laughs> something, something else is at play. So it's interesting and it's very, it's, I think it, it's bringing an aliveness into this time that, that we, have, we have to be in the not knowing. We don't know. No one knows, even those pretending. They have no clue what's going to happen. So there's a, there's a very, there's a freshness, there's an aliveness available that's really delicious, interesting, powerful at this time. And I'm not saying it's, it's going to be nice, but I'm, it, it just feels very interesting and very fresh. Oh, it's totally interesting, all right. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's vitally interesting. But I mean, I guess that's what I was uh, introducing when I said, when I, in the very beginning, I was saying, gee, I just looking and I'm saying so many components of our whole life on earth and our society and the way we really interrelate are psychological. And so then uh, I think we're in for a time when our psychology is going to get battered, you know, like our, and like we're going to have some stories that are really horrendous, like uh, our money's not worth anything or something like that. And all we plan to do with it and uh, on the, and the way we exchange it uh, is all, is changed every, every day, every minute, you know, and yeah. uh, somehow uh, we s somehow it's the strangest thing that we couldn't uh, as a as a humanity somehow say that parts of life should be honored and stable and protected. Instead, we threw it all to the wind and said, let's just uh, tear at it and see uh, what kind of, uh, who can get what. It's uh, amazing. It is an amazing move shift uh, on the planet, definitely. So, yes, I, I, just, I just think that, that all of this uncertainty is in a, in a very beautiful, palpable way, pushing people to, into the now. Because that's all, that's all you can know. All the planning it doesn't make any sense anymore. Because your pension might be gone next year. Yeah? Yeah. So, that, so, so, and, and this is, this is real. It's not, it's not to paint a dark picture or anything, but it's just to say that basically we don't know. And it's pushing everyone to really, really invest in the now because that's, that's all we can know. That's, that's, that's all we can touch. So it, it's 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 actually a very powerful setup, if you if you look at it from that. It's it's just words we can say about it, <laughs> but but very interesting in that way. It's a, definitely a setup. It's a definitely a setup. You know, I don't know about the finances of Europe so much. I know Italy is is a mess, and it's in the news now. Mm. I just uh, saw a special on uh, England. I thought they were protected because they didn't go into euros. They went into pounds and they stayed with pounds. But it turns out they've got a lot, almost a $5 trillion national debt, which is like uh, 70 or 80,000 <laughs> 80, pounds per, for every baby, for every ba in every last person. They're owed 70,000 pounds to nobody, you know. 
just, uh, you know, just like it's a giant float. The only way they can live is by floating on floating, you know, there's no way to, and it's, and a giant float, of course, is now a giant sink. <laughs> it's not going to float anymore, right? It goes up and it goes down. That's just the way it is. <laughs> but it is interesting. And, and, and also, also seeing that, that people are turning to people more making deeper connections because they are needed in a different way. And I think, I think that's, it's a beautiful movement, not painless, but beautiful in that way. So, so becoming less self-centered and, and reaching out and seeing that it is more simple things, the connectedness, the helping someone, the, the receiving of help, if you need that. And just, very simple things. That's, that is the beautiful simple. part of it. That's definitely the beautiful part of it, and it's definitely happening. But the thing about it is, is like you say, nobody knows what will happen. And so I think that, you know, the coming together and accepting of uh, people, maybe it's only 10% of what it's going to need to be. <laughs> you know, it's going to go way up. <laughs> we're going to be a one person, and because that's the only way we're going to survive, right? And we're going to have to drag everybody onto the boat and say nobody can be left off, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know. I think maybe someone needs to be left off. It's, it's not like you, you cannot decide. Even that we cannot decide. It's not, it's not in our hands. We can, we can, we can offer the boat if we have one. But that's really all you can do. You can only offer the boat. You cannot make anyone do anything. It's, if it's not in their makeup, then it won't happen. And it's just allowing that not happening also. Also that, I, I think it's so important that not to have any preference as to the outcome of all of this. And that, that goes for your personal life, that goes for, for the, this, this global scenario thing happening. Well, I mean, can, yes. can survival be a preference? Survival of the species or something like that? I mean, what do you mean by there's no preference? I mean there's no preference. So, so even, even saying even leaving the, the survival of the species, I don't know. Is that important? Who thinks it's important? I, 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 I recognize, of course, that in this body there is, there is an instinct to stay alive. Everybody has that in instinct. Every living thing has that instinct. But in consciousness, there's no preference as to whether this body lives or dies. And it goes, it goes, it's, this is a very personal thing, but I, I'm also experiencing this no preference on a global scale. I have no idea. I think the world is exquisitely beautiful. I love it. I love everything that grows. And I, I would like to enjoy it more. I would like to share it more. I would like for more happiness. I would like for more love to be expressed in this world. Yes, wonderful. But it's not in my hand. Mm. You know, in one, in and, one sense, I would say like uh, consciousness, okay, consciousness has no preference, but uh, instinct is inside of consciousness. So then let's just count on the instinct to f for survival and the instinct for mothering uh, is all these things are in consciousness they're in consciousness right and then if you get to the some pure spacious level maybe you'll notice that uh, well how can i say one thing over another but is that the same thing as no preference it just means like yeah. uh, you know i mean uh, i don't know and then also compassion is inside consciousness you know, and uh, mm. we don't like to see people suffer because it somehow reflects in our own being. You know, that same contraction, uh, we can feel it and we know that doesn't feel very good. It doesn't have to, and whatever not very good is, you know, it just means like why contract when you know, an opening is pretty cool too, you know. But, but you see, you see, Richard, even there, there's a preference of no suffering and, and also that preference extends to others. And I think there's this beautiful song going, I don't want to take your pain away because I know it's your ticket home. So there's, there's this, this, even if you, if you want to take the suffering away, maybe you're actually 
you're removing a possibility. You're 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 interfering with with the possibility, and it's the not knowing. I, I don't know what is right for me. I don't know what is right for this person in front of me. But I can, I can sit in this total readiness to experience whatever is coming, even death. And just sit in that openness, openness. I, don't, I have no idea what's going to happen and, and, and there is no, no need to know. And sometimes, you know, sometimes when I look at my daughter, I love her, she's 10 years old, and, and it, it's such an amazing privilege to be living with her. And I, I, there's, a, there's a bit of me, that personal bit of me, would, would of course want her to stay alive. But on this, in the vastness, there is no preference. In the vastness of my true being, there is no preference. How do you know that vastness supersedes the instincts and the and the mothering instinct and all the other things that are I part don't. and parcel of of this? I mean, you're saying and you're saying that like you really trust that 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 vastness supersedes actually uh, all the things that are all a part of that vastness too. But somehow, so everything arises from this vastness and everything returns from this vastness and then they arise again in a different form and it's it is the ground of the ground of connectedness the ground of oneness the ground of everything and i trust that i trust that more than anything i can find in the world of phenomena And I have no idea, I have no idea how this instinct, let's say there was a situation, how this instinct of motherhood would play out. And maybe maybe there would be a, a movement arising, shielding my daughter or making some, some kind of action. I have no idea. I mean, and that's, but that's also just arising from the vastness. I'm trusting, I'm resting in the vastness. And I am watching all of these strange experiences, manifestations coming up. And I'm still resting in the vastness. And it's not like, it's not like instinct could ever overrule the vastness, but in instinct might arise. Yeah, but instinct but a, instinct has a imperative, but the vastness has no imperatives. So then, in that way, the instinct can overrule the vastness because the vastness has no imperatives, no desires, and no desire to put anything down or be first. But the instinct arises from the vastness and returns to the vastness. That's it's always like that, even even the instinct to survive for this body to survive, if that's what we're talking about. It's, the, it's a good example. Everyone can relate yeah, to that. Yeah, it's a good example. You know, I mean, uh, well, let's see, something that's coming to me to say. You know, a huge resignment, uh, maybe a hidden resignment, and the experience mm -hmm. of vastness together might just uh, uh, allow a calculation to happen that says, oh, it's time to return. It's time to return home. To the vastness, you mean? Yeah, but that actually that calculation is is because of some kind of buried belief structure that uh, it's all over, you know. I I mean I'm saying these rough things, but I mean I think we're going to be in for some rough times, and so let's just kind of like run a few things by and see see what the feel because we're talking about yeah, stories make feelings, right? And we can have these feelings now, you know, and then we can have, and we can in in the face of these feelings, we can also. Uh, notice there's happiness for, for no reason, too, and to see how that works, or if it does. Yeah. Mm. 
but basically it i'm what i'm what i'm trying to say is that i i deeply know that the only thing i can trust and the only thing that will never leave me is the vastness or i will never leave it's not yeah, but the i mean when you trust it you certainly don't trust it for anything you know you just trust it because it's there but i mean it's not doing anything or it's not going to do anything it's not going to bring you anything it's just going to say hey i gave you two hands i gave you two feet do your thing you know and if you want to just fold fold exactly but you th you think you think you have free will are are you doing everything Okay, like acts and doing is made up of two components. Mm -hmm. Commission and omission. And it seems like a human has a possibility to do omission. Because we haven't noticed what they're doing to the Eurozone. We haven't even noticed it. And we're, and we're just, uh, uh, you know, we kind of resigned that politicians are crooks and uh, everything is going bad over there. So I'm not going to put that as part of my life, you know. And that's what I was saying in the beginning that uh, um, how did that subject come up? I was saying, do we have to insulate ourselves from... Uh, uh, from the world? From certain stories, right? But I, I, no, you were saying some people are wired to be, ha to be happy and some are wired to be gloomy. And I was saying, well, how do they how do they wire themselves to be happy? Are they ignoring? Do they keep denying world pain? And so then I think that's an act of omission, and uh, I think we're all totally guilty of that, you know, vastness or no vastness. And I, you know, maybe we're not doing that either. Somehow uh, we're hypnotized that uh, uh, just being numb is a really good solution to life. That's the mind solution, yes. But I mean, it's I, being it's it's really important for me to 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 explain how this uh, the vastness is not a numb place. It's it's not like I'm indifferent. I'm not saying indifferent. I'm saying no preference, but deeply engaged. Deeply, I'm deeply engaged with my life, and I'm deeply resting in the vastness. So, so it's it's not like I don't care about people. I don't care about the eurozone. I don't, I don't, I don't care about the suffering that the crash is probably gonna, the probable crash is is going to create. It is going to create a lot of suffering in in my reality also. But I don't have a preference. I I can just say okay if that's what's coming. I have no idea. This is a story. This is a projection. So basically, we have no idea what's coming. And and there's a, there's an engagement. I care deeply about people. I I care deeply about the planet. I care deeply about my family. I care deeply about a lot of things. So there's a deep engagement with life. That it's not it's not a, a shutting off. It's not a, an indifference. I think perhaps it is a much deeper aliveness. A much deeper engagement comes from being connected to this vastness. At least that's my experience. I think we have to go at this uh, uh, from several different directions because this is a huge subject, you know. Because you're saying, okay, there's no preference, but there's no, there's not, not indifference either. And uh, I think there's a huge confusion on that because a lot of people will stop at no preference and say it doesn't matter, right? And then nothing matters, and they're really cut off from it. They're really uh, uh, become a machine, really. If you can look uh, uh, suffering and death and uh, and disease in the face and say it doesn't matter, I mean, yeah. uh, how can that even compute? You know, and uh, but I mean, let's go at it a few different ways and keep explaining why uh, there's no no preference can possibly equal uh, uh, n uh, the l not equal indifference. What, what does that mean? I mean, let's pick those words apart and try to figure out yeah. how to say that. It's, it's good. That's a, that's a good, that's, that's a good plan. Uh, it's a heck of a <laughs> challenge, right? Yes. I think um, no preference includes for me a deep surrender to something, an intelligence that is beyond what I can ever understand. So 
in in inbuilt in this no preference is this this deep surrender to the moment and it's a happening every moment there's a deep surrender okay so this is what is okay this is what is and i have no preference there's just this okay this is what is and i'm not in any way indifferent i am deeply engaged i'm curious i'm frightened i'm looking at it and i'm not understanding and maybe i'm understanding so all of these different things can arise and there's absolutely no sense of indifference but there's a deep surrender and in that surrender is the no preference does that make any sense uh it sounds like in the no preference you know, you know one thing i wanted to add cuz you said like a deep surrender to the intelligence that brings this on but could we say it's also a deep surrender to the stupidity that brings this on <laughs> or do we have to call it intelligence <laughs> i don't know whatever your preference is i mean i i i just want I, them both in the I, mix you know so that i don't want it one way or the other but i don't want to just say it's only intelligent right it's just like uh the blindness too you know and then what i see out of it the empowerment that i see out of it is the no preference part is that you're st- uh, you're not in- disengaged if you don't get your your choice in other words since you don't have this choice or preference and uh, if it comes down the road that you're not going to get your choice you're not going to get your preference but you're but the no preference part says that you're still engaged and that you'll work with that then well then i'll just i'll just live with that then i mean i'll live with it and and uh i'll use all the tools that i'm uh, i've been given to uh to make it uh work for everyone that i know and myself and so then that's very empowering very empowering so in this no preference dancing can happen so there's a dancing with whatever arises that's possible but it's if if you have a preference oh no 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 not i don't want to go that way i want to go that way then the dancing is abrupt it's it's not fluid so in this no preference this fluidity in the response can happen and and that that's not possible if you if you get stuck in your preferences of course i have i have old wiring so i have all preferences coming up but i'm always i can always return to this vastness of no preference ah okay so all preference is arising and basically i'm returning to this openness and the fluidity of the dancing and not knowing where the next dance move is taking me so it's like a, an empowerment and a freedom to dance and yeah it's a freedom and uh yes and it's actually a deep se- deep sense of freedom and it's a it's actually in a way i mean i won't say managing but i guess i just did managing your energy because like you're allowing the energy to be whatever it is you know but you're not really clamping on it and uh you know with the contraction so there's no contraction in that surrender the contraction goes so there's a the pref- preference or keeping keeping hold of your preferences and really wanting to to have your preferences meet met there's a, there's a contraction so there's less space to move in the no preference you can move wherever life takes you and and so the, the response is fresher and freer there's a, there's a deep experience of freedom and empowerment in that no preference so then you kind of become immune to the psychological forces no you know that's how i kind of like introduced it and in that we have a lot that psychology is everywhere you know and the story actually um changes our our energy and shuts our chakras or whatever however we want to explain it turns off the right side of our brain or there's so many ways to look at it right <laughs> i don't know what <laughs> or turns it on or something like that but i mean somehow you're becoming immune to that you know cuz you're just uh, full on no matter what What do you mean by full on? I mean that's full on that's, just means you're in the flow, you know, no matter what happens with it, you know, you're not going to say that I'm going to limit my activity because it didn't turn out the way I pl- I I bargained on it. No, and some I'm I'm not I'm not I'm limit I'm feeling limitlessness, yes? Yes. In this and even 
but it's it's not to say that my life is peachy pie and pink skies and you know it's all fluffy duffy and nice it's everything and it's so beautiful because it's everything i would i think i would get totally bored if it was just pink skies all the time so it is just i can't even say allowing everything but there's an openness to everything that is totally engaged and totally relaxed at the same time. And somehow waiting for the next response to happen. If something needs to be responded on or just resting. And looking in from the outside, perhaps, it, it, it's, it doesn't look m much different than it did before this vastness opened. But it feels very different. And, and the freedom in it is totally different. So one thing I was thinking about even this morning was, uh, you know, the why I said it was the whole world, all our relationships, everything seems to be psychological. Well, then uh, so many forces try to manage that in a way that it turns out that um, the government, the universities, the news media, the banking systems, the financial systems, the business, everybody is kind of like a cheerleader. Uh, trying to pep us up, right? They're trying to say, yeah, it's just around the corner. Success is just around the corner. We're really doing good. They they tamper with the metrics. So the way we uh, measure inflation, the way we measure uh, unemployment and stuff like that, yep. they tamper with all that stuff so that it looks a little better, you know. And that the whole world is really a spin, you know. Uh, it's a giant spin machine. And, and if you think that there's any spin means like trying to take a story and make it yeah, and yeah, show yeah. the best yeah. side of it. And uh, and so then if you're thinking you want to find the truth, you know, I mean, there's really no truth out there. And then the other guys that are trying to give a more sober view, uh, they get into gloom and doom and, uh, and conspiracy and stuff like that. And, you know, that's off, too. So that in a way, I suppose the, the, the negative guys are trying to balance the ones that are way too positive and they get way too negative. And then and then we can't really know uh, what's true or, you know, we can't really trust uh, our mind or our, our, uh, or our thought process because it's all so full of, you know, you can call it lies and stuff, but in a way it's just uh, the way it is, you know. It's just that uh, we all recognize that the, that psychological force is so strong that uh, let's not try to poke a hole in it. Uh, you know, stick it with a pin and it'll all pop because it is pretty well puffed up anyhow. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, but but all of these all of these are just points of view or stories that's running in the collective consciousness in in collective mind, and they're just stories. They're just perspectives, and they cannot be trusted. I mean, mind is a lying, cheating bastard. Excuse my French. Uh, it's it's just. I mean, if if you look at it, it's just lying to so its teeth. It's lying all the time. It's just reducing reality all the time with all the stories, all the preferences that, and the growth is just around the corner, and oh no no, it's the shit's gonna hit the fan. It's it's gonna be gloom and doom, and it's just all perspective. It's just all stories, and it's lying. It is reducing reality that is there. It's vast. It's open. It's everything is possible in that. So, and, well, even more than everything is possible without that, too, because there you are in the vastness, and you're not really, uh, you're immune from that in a way, you know. You're going to operate no matter what happens, and then you're not really trusting what people are telling you either because you're not even full of mistrust, you know. You're just saying, well, that's just, that's just your story, you know, and I'm not really, don't operate on that, you know. I don't need that input. In fact, I could just shut off all the news and... And it would be just perfect, you know, which I've already done, right? <laughs> I've done that many, many. I've done that many years ago. I mean, no TV, no newspapers, no nothing. I mean, 
and and basically it's because i i'm not listening to the mind i am i'm really not interested in, in in what the mind has to say i'm just not interested i can i can hear it and it flows through i'm connected to collective consciousness that's that's just the way it is um so mind is flowing through and sometimes more intensely than than other times but basically i'm not listening well I'm, me too I'm, you know I'm me really... too i would say the same thing you know and uh but i'm i'm wondering if that somehow there, that's not overdoing it because like things happen and we're not even aware that they're happening right okay there's these I just bought this house uh, the same year that uh, all the banks fried and got bailed out, right? And uh, this was the worst time to buy a house, really, as far as like having, you know, paying too much for it or more than it's worth now. And then, uh, uh, well, uh, if, uh, apparently in the last five years, uh, 14 million homes got foreclosed on in, in, in America, like 50 million people got dispossessed. And I only learned about it now, two years later after it all happened. I mean, it's still happening, really. And so then, uh, isn't there a danger that you, if, yeah. if you're totally cut off from the news that you're not really, uh, it's some kind of like an artificial uh, cocoon you're trying to create? <laughs> you could say, but there's this deep engagement happening at the same time. I'm just not listening to mainstream news, but I'm very, I'm very curious of what is going on. So I'm following, I'm following the world but I'm very picky. I'm very picky with my sources. Um, and there's always this, yes, okay, that's a, an experience. Yes, that's okay. It's a perspective. It's a piece of a puzzle. But basically, we don't know and no one knows the truth. It's just a perspective. And I really value, I, I, I value all kinds of perspectives. But I'm... I'm not trusting them. I'm just looking at them as perspective. And I'm trusting the vastness. So there's a difference there. Sometimes there's interpretations, sure, but sometimes there's actually things that happen, right? Okay, a bailout is something that happened. Uh, the size of our national debt is something that happened. It just got increased. Uh, yeah. Something about our money system. that they, uh, You know, we're fighting the Federal Reserve here all the time and saying, who, who gives them the right to control us, right? And I just learned that uh, in the last four years, maybe the Federal Reserve uh, changed our money supply by 400%. Now, that seems like an enormous <laughs> amount of experimenting, you know. That's an enormous experiment, and they're just saying, let's put some air in here, you know, pump up this economy, you know. But 400%, I mean, how are they ever going to, if that doesn't work out, how are they ever going to get that 400% out? You know, there's really no mechanism. So, like, that's not a perspective, you know. That really is actually did happen, right? But the interpretation of it is... It's dire, no matter how you talk about it. <laughs> well, maybe it's not. Maybe it is actually what is pushing everyone to turn to what is real. Totally. So, I mean, we don't know. We don't know what it... We can say, this happened. Yes, okay, this happened. Point. That's, that's all we can say. Yeah. And it's, I'm, not, I'm not saying... I'm not saying to be disinterested in what goes on in the world. I'm not, I'm not in any way disinterested, but I'm wary of the stories. I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really trying not to be caught up in any particular point of view, any particular interpretation of events. Again, it, 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 we can return to the no preference. So, it's it's just important to say to really recognize that there are all of these different point of views and they're perfect but they are just point of views and basically we don't know that takes me right to where i want to go you know like i mean because uh, now i really want to hit home you know <laughs> but i mean i said i did all these setups about you know psychological and story and spinning and stuff like that and so now I want to just come in on you because you are acquainted with the vastness and then you have a daughter who's 10 and you want to give her something good, you know, you want to give her a good world to live in. And uh, 
if you possibly could, and the vastness says, well, maybe you can't, and maybe you can, but anyhow, I mean, and uh, maybe that's like what we're all thinking is that uh, even if we don't have kids, I don't have kids, but I still don't want to give such a junk society to uh, the next generation. And uh, so then, uh, in a way, you have to manage a story to manage her uh, uh, her her psychology, right? You don't want her to feel like there's nothing can be done and be closed off. And somehow, you know that opening or staying open is so important. Uh, but yet, you have to tell her that, hey, honey, you live in the eurozone, and <laughs> it's pretty weird, you know. And I wish I could change it for you, but in the meantime, uh, uh, what do you tell her? What's this? How do you spin that? I mean, you don't spin it, but I mean, you could just say, no, I don't spin it. When you get to the vastness, like me, you'll know what to do, or what? What do you mean? I mean, somehow you got to tell the truth, don't you? Or do you try to cover it up? Or I mean, you just ignore it, or never even say it, or say like. You know, let's uh, do work on a school project or something like that, but not telling her that maybe next year there won't be any school. <laughs> I, I'm not I'm not painting a very dark image, but I'm I'm telling her what is going on, what we I'm I, I but I'm not I'm I'm trying very much not to have interpretations when I talk to her, and sometimes she asks. It's really interesting because, of course, children pick up uh, on what is moving in collective consciousness also. And they see, they get a lot of information in school. And even if we don't have a TV, she gets lots of information, of course. And she's, uh, she's asking questions. So I'm, I'm basically just telling her, yes, this is happening. This is the difficulty we're in. This is what some people are saying. This is what other people are saying. And I am resting with her in the not knowing and saying, it's okay, we don't know. But it's okay. Not knowing is okay. I think the mind, the not knowing is the scariest place for the mind. That's, mind cannot exist in the not knowing. Mind needs to know this or that. This is true. This is not true. And so resting with her in the not knowing and in the trusting, that whatever needs to happen will happen and it's okay and there's no no fear and and i think basically what i'm giving her in that way is the no fear and that's that's perhaps the most important thing i can give her no fear And then if she's finding it difficult, or maybe she's, she's been with my mother and she's watching uh, the news in her place, it's, it's, it's fine. And she comes back and she asks questions and we talk about it. And it's okay. And there's no fear. And we don't know what's going to happen. Let's go in a little bit and investigate no fear, because I think it could be a cutoff too, somehow a cutoff or a bravado. Bravado just means like uh, false courage. And, uh, but no fear that we're talking about is like really being in the knowing that, uh, in certain cases, fear is very counterproductive. Mm, very. And, uh, <laughs> most, in most, <laughs> un unless perhaps you need to run from an angry bull. Okay, but I mean, you know, the facts are, if you've ever been in a really rough situation, once I fell off a mountain and stuff, uh, there's no room for fear in those situations either. And you just got to be all about running. Yes. And then, uh, and so then really many, many times fear is counterproductive. And it's only a dream. It's about a dream. It's about tomorrow uh, being wrong. It's about And me being powerless, case scenario. powerless uh, to survive, survive through it. And, uh, but I mean, exactly how is she being uh, with no fear? She just... Okay, and one more thing I'll say it this way, that uh, uh, the vastness can rest in uh, not knowing, and mind cannot rest in not knowing. So then somehow she has to get transported to the vastness, right? <laughs> but I think, I think being, being with my, me and my husband, she's, she's very much connected to that. I think it's, it's in the vibration. So it's not, it's not 
foreign to her in any way. Um, I don't know. I think uh, I think children copy their parents' energetic patterns, and that that happens in in positive ways and in negative ways. And so I think she copies this no fear. Mm. So she knows this, and she's not fearful. She is investigating, but she's not f- fearful. Yeah, definitely. And you know, you can't even say I think uh, kids copy. They, I know they copy. You know, I know I do. You know, <laughs> yes. we're all I, I reflecting each other. You know, totally. You know, that's like uh, the learning by imitation. You know, and not only imitating what we see and, and what we think, but also how we feel and, and how we uh, how we handle uh, situations and where we place our anger and our frustrations and our uh, depressions and all that stuff is just totally reflected. Like uh, exactly. You know, so that's easy to say. Yes, <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. Easy point. <laughs> oh yeah. What about this? You know, because I've talked to some people and ask about their kids. You know, because they're awakened people. Some people that say uh, uh, something. I was surprised by something, and I sometimes I call it awakening. I was totally surprised by something in my life, and so then uh, I'm just loving my kids. I'm just loving my family. We grow up. So I ask about the kids, like, uh, are they really, do they really live this same awakening, you know, aside from the fact that they're somehow imitating it? And I got a lot of times the answer that, uh, you know, the fish don't understand there's there's water there, you know, they live in, and they're so immersed in this opening that they don't really know it or really, you know, and then, I don't know, it seems like uh, I was asking, uh, well, does that mean the prodigal son is, you know, everybody has to go away uh, from from openness in order to understand that openness exists? Mm-hmm. I, I can only, I mean, I, I can only speak from experience with, with our daughter and... Um, She's she's ten and and she's she's moving into separation and that of course has been going on for a while. But what I'm finding is that she's not losing herself so totally as I did, because there is this field of connectedness, of no separation, is available to her all the time. So, and I can really, I can really see when she's moving into the experience of separation. And she has, she, apparently, she has to do that. As you say, to come back and to know it, to know that deep connectedness more intensely, more intimately, because you know the polar opposite. That is this deepest separation. And, so she's she's she has one leg in each cat, and sometimes she's moving into more more separation and losing herself more and trying to fit in more, and at other times she's resting very much in that openness with along with us, and and it's and again I'm I'm having no preference preferences I'm just watching, I can sometimes feel a deep pain that she has to go through this separation because I remember this pain of separation. I know it deeply. And yet I can see that apparently she has to go through that also. And it's part of this human experience, I think. It's uh, it's real coming becoming real clear to me that that has to happen and that what you're saying seems to be so wise that you're not pulling in one way or the other you say I have no preferences and maybe you, if anything the coaching could just be to notice that there's like two ways to be and that you can and please be feel free to try and to go as deep as you want into either side and to notice that because that is kind of like the dichotomy of humanity and that uh, that's the where the whole learning is and so then Notice just uh, where the the feeling is like everything's great, and notice where the feeling is like everything is awful, you know. And then, and yes. notice <laughs> notice all those things and uh, explore them to the fullest. And I could see if you would try to pull her in one direction that it would just would not work at all. 
you know it would not work at all and and there's there's this deep knowing of course it wouldn't work of course and i cannot spare her any of her experiences it's not possible she has to have them it's i can only i can only follow i can only be there and i can only point and i can only tell her what is going on and give her a language for it and and what i'm finding is that she is so finely expressed with what is actually going on and it's so beautiful to see a 10 year old re- having such such a precise language as to what is going on inside of her it's beautiful and she has her own process in all of this and i will not try to spare her anything It's amazing how precious childhood dreams are and to live in uh in where anything's possible and where everybody's uh everybody's uh, an uncle that that wishes you well and uh you're just a uh, living total blessing and and uh that just seems like such a valuable mm, slice of life and mm. uh you know it can't go too long but uh, hopefully 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 it it's not truncated too quickly so something about these young people uh i get I guess it's pretty clear that they're going to be giants. They already are, I think. There's there's something something very beautiful. They're so so conscious, I think. So there some of them. Um there's there's such such a strong sense of presence of essence in in many of them and uh it's it's just re- very interesting it's just really really interesting to follow how how their processes will unfold are you pleased with the danish education systems are they quite prog- progressive i would say yes I'm I'm so pleased with the school she's in and I couldn't say that for the Danish education system but I we're so privileged to have her in what we call a small school it's like only 60 pupils and it's very a lot of creative uh, subjects and drama and uh, movement and all kinds of things and it's very much their school it's it's they have they have a real sense of ownership a real sense of being a valuable contribution to the school and i think i think it's just such a privilege to have her in that um so we we're, we're very blessed with that opportunity um i think i think you you would probably say that that yes the danish school system is is quite progressive as I don't know. I think I think there's a lot of it it very much depends on who's teaching and who's running the school and how how the the connectedness with the parents are and it's there's so many so many factors. Um a system is a system and then you have people who are in the system and that that makes all the difference. everything that works must take involvement i mean i'm just guessing but i mean i know there's a lot of things that don't work and that that i hadn't been involved in and uh maybe not too many other people were either you know and so even those schools maybe uh there's a parent involvement and a and a caring and uh maybe all of denmark is kind of uh, homogenous i mean uh you guys only have danish people there or, <laughs> or do you got a few icelanders there or what <laughs> 
Yeah, a few Finnish people and some Swedes and some. It's 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 very homogenous. It's also. Hmm. Very pleased with itself. Yeah. <laughs> can an imagine? Can a homogenous society agree about things? Or I mean, like uh, so much of our mixed-up no. societies don't agree about anything. No, I think I think you have you just have your ordinary set of polarities uh, arising. So, I mean, any any society has conflict, um, and I think I think it's. Uh, I don't know. I think I think what I would actually really like is that it was life was a little more difficult here because it would push people to make true and real connections and contributions. Life is in some ways I'm finding it's too easy. It's so people get complacent and disengaged because they don't have to be engaged. And so uh, that that is uh, that is something that I'm sometimes longing for in in this mm. society. But that's that's just me. Do you have a good employment rate? And uh, do you have a you know a good? I mean, do you have a, a small prison system? Or I mean, do you have a crime rate? Or I mean, very little, very little. Um, and and I I have no idea about the well the employment rate is is way up right now because we have we have the crisis even if we are not in the euro we are still deeply connected to the euro so um, oh you're not in because I thought you said you were in the euro you're not in the euro uh, we are we are in the eurozone but we still have kronos oh Danish kronos yeah oh. <laughs> but I mean it's it, it's such a small currency so we are still we are still very much connected to the euro. And we are we are within the EU, but we are not in the Euro Corporation. It's just techniques, I think. Kind of amazing. We get the privilege to have uh, histories and and countries and just uh, you know cultures and uh, languages and we can we can honor our our fathers and grandfathers and and the way they built their lives and somehow we can still act out these things and. And uh, and also relate to the rest of the world. I would I would say one thing is one thing I really enjoy about the Danish culture is that we're we're such a small cr- country, like we have five five million people only, and we need to connect. We cannot we cannot make it on our own. So there's a there's a porousness in the country in terms of having having contact everywhere because that's that's what we need. We've had we've had had a long history of that. Um, just because we are so in, infinitely small <laughs> compared to many other countries, and I think that's a that's a beautiful trait. So you called it porous. Porous, yeah. Could you say that? Por- I don't know. I mean, I want to know what you mean by that. Porous means somehow that things can come in and go out, right? Yes, exactly. Think there's, a, so there's a there's allowing a flow. Yeah. It's not. So there's a there's a there's a, it's not not a solid uh, border. It's more like a porous thing, because things come and things go, and you have all kinds of threads leading everywhere because. We are too small to make it just us. Um, and, and also in, in terms of language, we, it, it's just, just five million people speaking Danish. And so everyone else has a, a second or third language. And 
yeah, it's uh, it's good. So that's a great learning about our own uh, personal self, you know, the the need for porous, being porous and and flowing. But yet you're saying maybe that doesn't even happen enough inside between the different no. uh, poles of, uh, you know, the, but. Uh, I, I think, I think it happens. It's, it's well, porous on the outside, but not on the inside, perhaps, <laughs> if I should characterize it. But I think, I think on a, on a personal level, being porous, being, exploring this, the nature of being porous is so interesting. You're constantly exchanging everything with everything. And so it's a state of being. It's a, it's a, it's a reality. It has physicality to it. Um, and I think, I think if we begin to explore that more, we will see how much exchange is going on and we become less solid in the process, I think. More fluid. You know, I, uh, that's, that's an exciting way to put it because uh, uh, a lot of times we talk about awakening as uh, somehow uh, a deconstruction or like uh, of the barriers, right? Like it's somehow, and maybe sometimes it's just a fall, a collapse of a separateness, mm -hmm. a collapse of separateness. And it seems like that's rather uh, a stark way to do it. You know, it's uh, it's uh, really it could be easier just to kind of take a few bricks off at a time, or you know, just notice, start to notice porosity. You know that uh, things do flow in and out, and and you know whether we call it connection or whether we call it oneness or whether we call it just a process. But you know, uh, it's kind of like a real curiosity is. How could uh, this porosity be uh, spread to the world, spread throughout the world? And if you claim it's not a porosity, it just has to be a collapse, it's not going to really spread very well because people are going to resist it and say, no, that's the last thing I want. Are you kidding? It, it's too much for the mind. I mean, but porosity, we can work with that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that just kind of like so, but, um, honors a gradual awakening or uh, just a kind of a broadening, a gradual broadening expansion of, of your being and and but I think I think basically what's what's interesting in this is exploring exploring what is being exchanged all the time and when you put your awareness to that you'll see you'll see there's no solidity to anything everything is in constant flowing dancing moving in and out of everything and it is a real reality you can you can sense it you can experience it it's not something spiritual. It's not, not, it's very simple. You can get your hands on it. If you really turn your attention, you're, there's a constant inflow and outflow. No, I can see that totally. You know, the, the solidity is the concepts that we put on. The, it's the wallpaper we put on everything. And then we say yeah. like, oh boy, that's, you know, that's <laughs> this, that's this. I know that, you know. And then that's the con the conceptual part. A concept is just a word that means so much until they rewrite the dictionary, right? And then it moves yeah. a little bit, right? But it really doesn't move. So the, all the solidity is, well, uh, you know, uh, the appearance of solidity is where we put our attention. We're putting our attention on our, our thought processes and our conceptual uh, uh, model of the of the universe. And uh, that's the part that's getting always nudged and uh, and cracked, and that uh, and also that conceptual conceptual structure somehow uh, has a lot of feeling to it. So then every crack makes a a, a big a big uh, shake in the system. It's an earthquake in the feelings and the in the moods and everything. And so then somehow to get uh, allow it to be a little more porous and and take less seriously those those uh, feelings. Uh, that's kind of like a salvation of the world, really. I think. I think if more people just recognize that basically the, this is what's going on, this por porosity—is that what you call it? And it is going on all the time. Then, 
we don't we we are constantly changing everything so we don't need to hang on to anything I don't know. so make makes life a lot easier I don't know that's a Danish contribution I think you know the concept of uh, porosity or like uh, less solidness or you know uh, one step at yeah. a time less solidness really beautiful until you're comfortable you're you're com until you're comfortable with less and less solidity until you are okay with this fluidity that is really at the core of your true being just so then that's it, you know, like uh, that, that is really the final connection or, you know, uh, a further connection, let's say, because it's not just the fact that it's porous, but it's also that your feelings are okay with that now. But before I wanted it to be fixed and I wanted a boundary here and I wanted uh, to be safe back here behind there and all the turmoil was out on the other side of this boundary. And then I realized this boundary's got a few holes in it and it gives me feelings. And then uh, I realized, no, there's more holes in that thing. And then I realize it's only really a curtain hanging there, <laughs> and it's got a few rips. In, it's thing. got a few rips in it too, right? <laughs> yes. And it's okay, and you become more and more comfortable with the fact that that is real, and that the other reality is a construct. Oh, it is real. Yeah, the other other reality is the falseness, right? All what I always counted on was it actually doesn't it never was there, it never existed. It was always an imagination. Mm. And then uh, all my uh, uh, feeling of secureness was all an imagination. And uh, that too, that something needed to be secure was all yeah. in the story and the imagination. Yeah. It's a, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a huge construct. It really yeah. is. And then that you know you get to all your separation was an imagination. I mean you you really start to find out what Leela or or Maya, or all these uh, old words meant, you know, like illusion, you know. Okay, I was counting on an illusion, and somebody had to tell me the truth. Darn it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how to diffuse that thing from the, the bodily feelings, right? If mm. a little at a time is probably the to best. Dis disengage, yes. Yeah, yeah. For some people, it needs to happen like this. For other people, it needs to be slow moving. And, and so there's no recipe. It's just, it happens as it happens. I'm not so sure because the ones where it happens like this, and then they're dysfunctional for years afterwards. And then they have to kind of rebuild on that, and that and the lim more limited structure or the absence of structure. I, I think there's just as many, way more stories where something happened in a snap and, uh, and uh, then they were uh, just totally out of it for years. And then finally they pulled it back together and said, oh, well, this means, oh, I see, that was an illusion. Oh. And then all those feelings went away, you know, the ones, feelings now are not only anger and stuff, but feelings are depression too. And so then they just went into a catatonic, uh, you know, stage where they couldn't do anything. I think that's more, way more common. So I prefer the gradual. I prefer the, I think for the society, it's way, way better, you know. I'm not so sure the planet is elastic enough to take uh, those shock treatments. I don't know, <laughs> but it's it's just to see that that there's a there's an interpretation that that they're they're not here or they're catatonic or uh, they're dysfunctional, but that dysfunction I think also has a function. So resting in the vastness has has deep value, just as going there gradually. It's just different different ways, and and I think. Even the vibration of just resting, resting in the vastness and not having any boundaries whatsoever has value. It has a reality. It is. And not functional. That's, that's when you look at it with, with, the, with the spectacles of, of the world, you need to be functional. What is that? Some strange functions going on out there. But being dysfunctional is just an experience.
and has value as any other experience has. Or has no value. <laughs> it's not it's not about value, but it's just to recognize that it is. That too. I think you've said things that are so clear. I just feel like that uh, the things that we've discussed uh, are a, uh, a new perspective that, or a more simple perspective, or just one that's schooled on uh, on on growing up and living in a very small place that has really a more more true view. It doesn't need the structures. It doesn't need the uh, the constructs that it's known all along that these contra constructs are, are useless. Mm. I don't know I'm Danish. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <laughs> That'll get you a few miles, anyhow. <laughs> 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 and so then you don't have those kind of constructs. I think we just have different constructs in Denmark. Oh, yeah. Just, but all constructs, I think, yeah, we just... No, what I, what I was trying to say is that, that since we, we put so much energy into the constructs, or society does, and, and most people are, are just basically feeding the construct with more uh, stories and perspectives and points of views and whatever it is. And I can sometimes feel it's difficult to, to, to participate because it doesn't really make much sense to uphold the construct, to participate in, in the upholding of it. So how how do you how do you engage without actually feeding the construct? I'm finding that a difficult balance sometimes. And sometimes I succeed and sometimes I don't. Um, but it's difficult because we, we don't we don't really we don't really share the perspective that it is a construct. Right. When you are lo when you are lost in illusion, you think that it is real, and so looking in from the outside, you totally see it as illusion and construct, and it's difficult sometimes. I find. Yeah, I think that's uh, a tendency. I noticed that uh, when people say I'm in the vastness and all those constructs aren't so real and it's hard to really they, they don't matter you know and then all of a sudden there's no energy or no interest in them and uh, and then and then I say we're we're acting but we're acting on omission instead of commission you know we're uh, we're we're allowing the world to uh, go maybe horribly wrong when we could see that it wasn't necessary and uh, but we choose to stand back because it just seems like you know maybe it's just a trick that the energy kind of deflates when we have a story that it doesn't matter and we have that story we're so sure of it because we know the vastness doesn't really have any preferences or have any uh, it's not even you can't say it doesn't care because caring is kind of a human emotion but it just you know that whole series of judgments and and uh, better and worse are not there and and uh, so then, in a way, that's what's allowing uh, uh, all hell to break loose. I don't know. I think it's a kind of a dangerous part. Or so, I mean, it seems like that's where something's missing in uh, in awakening. It could be missing. And later people do come back, I think. They, they come back to society. I don't know. They call it, the Buddhists call it the tenth bull, right? I mean, like after you're in the vastness, then you come back and you're just regular, normal. Yes, you're a normal human being, and you just do normal human being things. Right. And, oh, right. But I do that. I do that. But I, I'm what what I'm trying what I'm trying to say, maybe maybe not so very clearly. Um, 
what I'm trying to say is that that I'm I'm deeply engaged with the vastness. I'm not very deeply engaged with the construct, but I re I'm deeply engaged with embodying the vastness and being in the world. And sometimes it's a tricky balance. And and basically that's that's just how it is. And but I'm 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 engaged with the world very much so. Well, that's the truth we wanted to hear, you know. We didn't really want you to say, oh, it's simple and it's all real clear when you get there, you know, and there's nothing to do because it's so easy. No, there's a huge challenge. And uh, that's okay. the truth that we want to know. How beautiful. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I totally appreciate, you know, what we've said and the pace that we've set it at and uh, how really things have unfolded here that just seem very settling and very centered and very uh, empowering. And uh, without saying any kind of hocus pocus or like, uh, you know, the powers of, uh, of uh, the spirit or anything like that, you know, that we have to just kind of trust in. Because we've trusted in so many things that uh, have fallen flat, why do we need to trust? I mean, we're we're, we're supposed to have our own experience, and not uh, and not delegate that to uh, some higher knowing or some scripture or some uh, some spiritual teacher. You uh, know, mm. we have to stop delegating our own Absolutely. our own awareness. Yes. You know. And, and our own engagement. I don't know, <laughs> what a great time. I really, really enjoyed it, I tell you. So have I. It's been really lovely to talk to you and just to see what was flowing. It's very interesting. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Cecile. And you. And I always say thanks to everyone watching and uh, come again, bring your friend and uh, <laughs> convince your wife to watch this. And, <laughs> <laughs> and yes. I'm only apologizing that it takes so long, but, but that's just the pace of life, the pace of having a conversation and the pace of not really trying to get anywhere. And then uh, that's what we're really trying to show you, or like I think we're demonstrating that mm, you're getting somewhere anyhow, but if you're trying to get there before you get there, uh, you're, you're just trying to verify your preconceptions. So yeah. then, uh, so sorry, but it's a couple hours, you know, <laughs> out of your life. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yes. you, Cecile. Yes. Thank you, too. It was great. Yeah, really lovely evening. Yes.